I think with with Matthew and Wout coming in, it forced everyone to really up their game. And I genuinely believe that if you put people who were winning the races in 2014 in a race today, they would be nowhere close to the front. Like I think the whole sport has progressed a lot. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Cyclocross Social Podcast. Today, the weekend after Mole, we have another rider on the podcast and again it's a rider from Canada. With us here is the Canadian champion in the men's category, Michael van der Ham. Hey Michael, thank you for coming on with us today. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. It's great to be here. Could you maybe give a short introduction of yourself to our listeners? Absolutely. So like you said, my name is Michael Vandenham um, from Canada, from the far west coast. I live in a place called Chilliwack, BC. I race for the Easton Giant presented by Transitions Life Care team. And I've been racing cross. Well, I'm 28. So probably for the last 10 years, been back and forth between here and Europe. Well, it's really nice to have you on. We'll be asking you a few snap questions uh, to get a bit a better picture of you. So I'll start off. Do you prefer a race that's muddy or perhaps a more grass parkour? Uh, for racing, definitely one that's muddy, but I, I'll have to admit this uh, this cares period when it was muddy race after muddy race, I was pretty happy when we got to Zolder and there was, you know, no pressure washing the kit, nothing like that. You could just go home and, and start relaxing right away. But yeah, usually a muddy race. And then do you like a, a slow or a fast parkour? I prefer to race the faster ones. I'm better at the slow ones. I'm better at stuff like Dendermond or uh, Worlds last year in in, um, in Switzerland. Those really slow, heavy ones are kind of where I excel, but... I would prefer to race the flowy ones with lots of acceleration. So I guess a little bit of both. And then would you like it to be totally flat or maybe a bit or hilly or maybe even extremely hilly? Um, probably somewhere in the middle. My One of my favorite courses is Namur, and that's definitely on the hillier side of things. Um, and results-wise, I usually do okay there, but just the whole atmosphere around that one. And, and I like the bigger more mountain bike style features that a course like that has um but again i do best at the ones that are you know flat field riding um so yeah i guess depends if you're looking at which ones i excel at and which ones i prefer to race well we certainly hear a lot of riders saying they like namur so it must be a great parkour to race something that you won't really find there anymore is the barriers if you come to a barrier would you fancy a bunny hop or a quick run oh yeah i I mix it up a little bit. So uh, the series, all the race series sort of use the same bar- barriers from race to race. So I'd say I, I hop the ones in the, the trophy series, the X2O series, almost all the time. They're a little bit lower. I don't always hop the World Cup ones. It, it has to be like a kind of a perfect setup for them. They're a full 40 centimeters and they're the big wide ones that have the, the advertisements on the other side. So for me, it's usually faster to run those. Generally, my rule of thumb is if I'm thinking about having to hop the barriers, in pre-ride, I'm probably not going to do it in the race. It needs to be something that's pretty automatic. I don't want it to, to take away from my race at all. If I can just roll up to them and hop them right away, then then I'll do it every time in the race. And what's your favorite tire thread to race with? I I just got on FMB Super Muds this year, and I have to say that tire is amazing. Like, you know, you it, it's maybe it's a little bit much for all of the courses, but I I think I raced at every race I did when I was over in Cares period this year, except for Zolder, and it just hooks up so, so well. Who would you consider to be your favorite rider on the road, mountain bike, cyclocross, whatever? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, to be honest, I don't spend too much time thinking about favorites. It's kind of a, a little funny when you're in the middle of it, but if I'm watching a race from home, I'm usually cheering for Wout. I like to see him do well. I'm, I'm not no reason in particular. I just think he's kind of the, the consummate professional and an interesting person. So I have nothing against against Matthew at all, but I cheer for Welt when they're going head to head. Then a different topic. What's your favorite meal to eat? Oh, that's probably pizza. I, I love pizza. I, I usually make it, I'll either make it at my, my house at least once a week or if anytime I'm traveling. This year was a little bit different, but try to go find a, a good pizza place like real Neapolitan, thin crust style. And with a pizza, if you eat it at home, what's your favorite show on Netflix or TV to watch with it? Probably Drive Drive to Survive, the, the F1 show. Um, I, I find it really interesting because I think in a lot of ways, F1 is, there's some similarities between F1 and cyclocross, the way the races go. And I think in some ways, cross could do some more things that F1 does. The F1 does such a great job of marketing itself and, and showing off each of the riders. And there's, there's so much conversation about everyone, whether it's, uh, 
you know, Lewis Hamilton or whether it's Mick Schumacher, like everyone knows who everyone is in that. And cyclocross could do a little bit of a better job of that, of, of making sure that the people leave in the back of the field, um, there's, there's storylines around them. So yeah, I really enjoy watching F1. Well, that's definitely something I agree on what you said. Uh, we're coming to the end of the snap questions. What's your favorite song to listen to pre-race? Ah, uh, this one's maybe a little bit embarrassing, but I listen to Eminem's uh, Lose Yourself fairly regularly, which is I probably the only rap I listen to, but that's uh, definitely one of my one of my pump up songs. I wouldn't call that embarrassing. It's a good song. <laughs> Personally, I listen to it as well before racing uh, uh, Time Trial. It's really a good song to get in your head. Uh, and, yeah, uh, even the lyrics. Even the lyrics are good for it too, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. And then the last snap question is, what would you consider to be your career best result? You know what? I would have to say either that, that 17th place I just got in Dendermond, and partly because that's that's the best World Cup result. Well, tied for the best world cup result I've had, but definitely the best race I've ever put together in Europe. I'm, I'm really happy with that one. And then probably maybe the, it wasn't quite as, as hard to achieve, but it took me a few years was the first time I won Canadian nationals in 2017. I'd sort of gone into nationals the, the couple years prior to that as the favorite. And, you know, to be honest, sort of crumbled under the pressure. So when I, I finally did put it together and race a really clean, good composed race, that's something that I'll remember forever. Those are definitely some good results. And for that race in Dendermonde, we'll come back later in this podcast to talk about that one a bit more in depth. Now let's go on to talk about your cyclocross career. How did you start cycling? Did you start on the road or in cyclocross? Well, Honestly, I, I started, so I grew up on a farm in rural Manitoba. So um, for, for that's the, basically the prairies uh, for, for European list, listeners, you know, cornfields, wheat fields, um, pretty, pretty empty out there. And I, I started riding just to get around. Uh, I would ride to town, which was about a, a 10 kilometer ride and ride back for something to do. Um, so I didn't have to rely on my parents to drive me everywhere. And it sort of snowballed from there. So my first, the first race I ever did was a mountain bike race. Um, not until I was 16, so a little bit later in the sport than, than a lot of people get into it, I guess. But, um, and then I thought I was a road racer for a bunch of years. But the first time I, I ever realized that I might be good at cycling was in cyclocross. Um, they, we had sort of had this really small training race, basically. And I showed up on my mountain bike. Um, this is when I was 18. So again, a little bit later into the sport, but showed up on my mountain bike and raced and I don't know, got second or third or something like that, that, and kind of realized like, Oh, I might actually, actually be good at this. And I guess you could say it sort of snowballed from there. And then you started riding more races. How is that in Canada? What's the situation of cyclocross in Canada? Is it popular or there are a lot of races or is there really only a few races you can go to? Yeah, so I would say that for the population of Canada, so it's kind of a funny spot because Canada is a huge country, right? It's like 240 times the size of the Netherlands, um, if you if you want to wrap your head around that. And it only has a population that's, it's 37 million people. So what's that, like maybe three times the size of Belgium, something like that? So there, it is a popular sport given how many people actually live here, but one of the challenges that cross faces in Canada is everyone's pretty spread apart. So there's sort of like a, a popular scene in where I live in, in Vancouver. And then, you know, a, a thousand kilometers away, there'll be another, another city where it's popular. And then a thousand kilometers away from that, there'll be another city. But I would say overall, the sport's growing. Um, it just has some of the challenges where even though people like it across the whole country, there's only a couple opportunities where everyone gets together and race it. But yeah, the sport's growing. We get maybe it, it's participant. A lot of the sport is participant based here in in Canada and just like it is in the US and our local race series will have maybe 500 people do a do a race on a given weekend. So I think that's pretty good. So is that those races, do they take place like close to those big cities as well? So for let's say one month, there's a race in near Vancouver and then the other month you need to go all the way to the other side. So there's not really a national series at all in Canada. So I would say there's a whole series a whole sort of local race series that happens around Vancouver. And then at the same time, there'll be a whole local race series that will happen around Toronto and one that will happen around Montreal. Um, But we don't have any type of national series. So there's not really any opportunity for riders from one region to go to another to race the best riders there and and back and forth. The only time that really happens would be the national championships. 
Um, but most of Canada's best cross racers spend a lot of the season doing the UCI races in the U S. So we kind of end up, you know, competing against each other and all the American riders while we're there. Well, you already mentioned that when you were around 18, that was the first time you really found out you could be good in the cross. And how did you develop for going forward from there? What were the next steps you made? Yeah, I think it, uh, nothing too complicated really is I, I started racing, like I said, that training race series. And then I started racing sort of the local race series. I was living in a city called Edmonton then. And then the following year, I went to the national championships for the first time. And I, I actually had, I was lucky enough to meet someone who ended up being my coach for four or five years after that and, and basically said, hey, I think, you know, he said to me, hey, you're good at this. I think you could race the world championships in Louisville. So that was in 2013, that Louisville World Championships were the first time ever that, that cyclocross worlds were in North America. And we kind of quickly turned all of my all of my attention to that and started traveling to a couple of the the closer UCI events to myself. And I, I did end up making that team. And it was almost like I just raced a little bit more every single year until I started doing the, uh, the full UCI calendar in the US or as much as possible. And then I started traveling to Europe uh, every year for worlds and around Christmas time. So you raced those races there in America. Is that the step you would consider necessary if you are a cyclocross rider from Canada to be able to make the step to Europe later on? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think for any Canadian riders, they need to be able to go to the UCI races in the States and be consistently finishing, you know, in the top 10 or the top five. And and if you aren't there, it's it's too big of a jump to go to Europe. You know, we've we've seen it like Matthew and Matthew and Wout are probably two of the best and Tom Pidcock to an extent too, are probably some of the best cyclists in the world, period, not just the best cyclocross racers. So you can't really expect to go from racing, uh, you know, the the fastest local guy to racing them in, in one jump. You need to sort of have a stepping stone. And then eventually you were able to make the step to come and race in Europe. Uh, how did that go? Was that easy? Because I can imagine there were quite some challenges for that to be possible. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, definitely. So in I had gone to Europe for Hogerhead Worlds, I think that was 2014, I want to say. And that was my first experience ever racing cross in Europe. And I went over as a part of uh, the Canadian national team. So a lot of that, you know, it's it's not quite the same as being a, a Belgian rider. Like we're we're still working out of the back of the van and don't have an RV or anything, but a lot of the logistics were taken care of. So that made it a lot easier. And then in 2016, uh, 2017, I, I ended up actually spending three months in Europe. My wife, my wife and I moved over for uh, basically cockside onwards. And we just, we just stayed in Odenard, lived there, did all the races. And I actually think that was really, really important for me to get a sense for how the racing goes and to get more comfortable racing in Europe and to see that I could compete with, with some of the European riders. I think one of the challenges for North Americans is we, we spend so much time watching the races on TV that it almost seems like every European, every Belgian riders, you know, they're way better than we are. And there's like a little bit of a, a um, identity crisis there where you almost need to go over firsthand and see that you can compete and see that, you know, sure. I'm not going to be racing with Vanderpool, but I can, I can race with, um, some of the other Belgian pros. And that, that, that was really important for me to, to actually firsthand go and experience. Um, so I spent that whole season racing in Europe and yeah, it sort of got comfortable and it's made every year. I haven't spent that much time since then, but it's made every year following easier because I, I sort of understand how to jump into the races and feel good right away. And um, I've been here enough times that even something as simple as like knowing the training route, training routes around where I stay takes a little bit of that stress out i can just go out and train now so yeah it gets easier the more i go back basically and when you made the step here first uh, in your first season did you get some strange looks of people who maybe didn't expect a rider like you to come and race here um a little bit there at the time there was a couple canadians already over here doing a similar thing um a guy named aaron schooler and another guy named mark mcconnell who would uh, basically were, were over for that that three or four month span as well. So I think that we are actually really, really well embraced by the Belgian fans. Everyone, everyone was super friendly and I would, you know, I'd actually get some cheers going around. That was, um, that was Sven's last year of racing. So the crowds were absolutely huge. And um, I think that there was a lot of people who would sort of cheer for, cheer for Sven. And, and that was Matthew and Welts early season, early years. 
And then a few minutes later, we're, we're excited to cheer for someone else. And lucky enough, that was me a lot of times. If you look at the years past that, after you first came here until where we are now, how would you say that you've developed yourself as a rider? Yeah, I, I would say that it's never been a, a big jump from, from one year to the next, but I think I've seen sort of steady improvement every year. Um, I've gotten a little bit better results every year. I've ridden a little bit better every year to the point where I've, I've definitely done some of my best races last season and, uh, you know, a couple, a month ago when I was, when I was just there. Now it's been tricky because I think in general, I think the whole sport has improved a lot. I think with, with Matthew and Wout coming in, it forced everyone to really up their game. And I genuinely believe that if you put people who were winning the races in 2014 in a race today, they would be nowhere close to the front. Like I think the whole sport has progressed a lot. I've, I've been able to keep up with that and maybe get a little bit better, but it's, uh, yeah, I'm significantly faster than I was five years ago, but maybe the results don't always show it because everyone is significantly faster than they were five years ago. Yeah, that's more what I meant, because if you're improving yourself, it doesn't always need to show in the results. And the results, for me at least, they never tell the full story. So mm -hmm. that's more why I asked, because it's easy to be overshadowed. Yeah, the results are always the same. And it's, yeah, it's maybe not the top 10 results, but also the riders outside of the top 10, they're doing a tremendous job. And it must not be easy to, especially this season, to be able to come over here in such a difficult period. How did that go? Yeah, so I, I basically hadn't raced. Um, when I showed up, Havre was my first race. And when I showed up there, I had not done a cyclocross race since Worlds um, in Switzerland in, in February. So I would say it was a little bit of a shock. Um, I definitely felt it. So I'm the type of rider that be, I excel on those like sort of slow speed, heavy courses. And as a rider, I'm, I would describe myself more as like a, a diesel-y, I'm good at doing extended efforts, but I'm not as good at doing the punchy efforts. And for someone like, someone like me, that makes not racing maybe even a little bit harder because I always find that I need to sort of race myself into shape. I need, I need a bunch of those high, high intensity sessions. So even though I spent time motor pacing, I spent time doing intervals in preparation for coming over here, nothing really prepares you for racing like, like racing does. Um, so I felt like I was a little bit on the back foot for the first couple weeks, but it was still so important just to come over to get a little bit of a race season, both because it's, it's what I love to do and it's important for my sponsors, but also because next year the world championships are back in North America, they're in Fayetteville, and I, I have some big goals for next season. So I think if I missed this entire season, it would make it so much harder to come into next year and achieve what I want to achieve. And this season racing as Canadian champion, of course, it wasn't easy, as you said, to come over. But after Havre, do you think that um, there was a, definitely a trend that it got better and better in terms of race and the feeling and results as well? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I Havre, Havre, I just felt, you know, I just got off the plane on Thursday and was, was a little bit jet lagged and uh, hadn't raced in a long time. And I knew going in that that race wouldn't be, wouldn't be that good. But even by the time I got to Namur the following week, and then uh, I, after Namur, I raced Essen and Horentials, Zolder, Dendermond. Um, even when I got to that, I, I, like you said, I started feeling a little bit better every single race, whereas I actually probably felt my, my best in, in Ball and Holst, but I just, you know, I didn't quite have the results in those ones, but I was definitely feeling good. I almost wish I, I had another couple of races after that to keep on going. And then that World Cup and then the Monde, that's definitely the standout performance. You already said it. You could even consider it your career best result. Could you tell us about how that race went for you? Yeah, of, of course. Um, so we raced a really similar track at Worlds last year, that course in Dubendorf in Switzerland. I um, Similar in the sense that there wasn't really a ton of, of very technical features, and it was a lot of just hard, heavy pedaling over and over again. And I took some lessons from that because last year in at Worlds, I was having a really good race. I was in, I think, 17th or 18th until about 45 minutes in and then completely blew up and the wheels came off and um, figuratively. And I, I finished up in 24th, but I was like, you know, if we had done, if I'd done another lap, I wouldn't up, it would have ended up in 26th. I was, I was totally blown up and going backwards at that point. So I took some lessons from that towards Dendermon, seeing that the course was similar and just as heavy. And I think I just paced myself really, really well. Um, every lap I sort of finished in a better place than I had started and raced really consistently. I think I only went through on lap one and maybe like 
30th place or something like that, but kept on moving up and moving up and never felt like I, I totally blew up. And in a race like that, it's just, it's partly fitness and it's partly just maintaining a steady pace and partly staying engaged in it mentally. Cause it's really easy to go, okay, I've had enough. This is really hard in, in something like that. And I think, you know, we all watched, Lars Vanderhaar on screen sort of have that same thing where he just had enough and, and pulled out. So um, being able to just keep on plugging forward was probably the most important part of the race for me. I mean, it was definitely a good performance. We could see on the lifetime on the screen, definitely moving forward and forward during the race. And it was definitely, I think you must be hoping that there are some more tough races like that uh, on the planning anytime soon. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think I, for me that was important because i was able to see when i do a good race that's where my fitness can can put me is inside the top 20 inside the top 25 and now my goal moving forward is to be able to replicate that um as much as possible and in other races like i would like i don't just want to be a a slow heavy race specialist i want to be able to do that same result in zolder do that same result in um in the mer do that same result on a wide variety of courses so I think I've taken a lot of information from that and sort of identified some things that I need to work on so that next season I can, you know, I can make a lot of my races top 20s as opposed to just one. And then the race after that, I mean, it must have been quite a shock from your best result to maybe the worst result of the season, <laughs> the disqualification in Baal. What happened uh, there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've told this story a couple of times now. Um, you know, I... Uh, I, I basically forgot what the rules were in the middle of the race. So what, what happened is I flatted. Um, so in ball, there's a fairly extended climbing section going into the first time through the pits. And in our race, it was really, really muddy. So muddy that sometimes, sometimes when it's really muddy, you can't really tell how much air pressure you have in your tires. It's so low that you're just riding through slop and it, it, you know, 15 PSI feels like zero PSI. So I, at some point on that climb, I flatted and I, I just didn't realize that that I'd flatted. And basically, as soon as you finish that climb, you turn a corner and and you end up along the pits and the ground becomes significantly more hard packed. Um, So I turned the corner, I went by the pit entrance and realized almost right away that I had flatted and that I was riding on a a rear flat and to be honest, kind of panicked. And uh, so the rule, what you're allowed to do is you're allowed to turn turn around when you're beside the pits and go into the pit entrance, that's something you're allowed. But what I did is I went past, I went past the pits and then I went into the exit. And that is something that you are definitely not allowed to do. And I know that's the rule. I've heard that's the rule many times, but you know, sometimes in the middle of a race, I'm not thinking so clearly. So I went in the exit and then I, I proceeded to, uh, I actually told my mechanic, I said, Avery, I think I just broke a rule, but uh, I'm going to keep on racing and we'll see what happens. And so I raced the next half a lap and then the, uh, the, the commissar pulled me out and um, he kind of looked at me. He's like, uh, do, you, do you know what you did? And I had to go, yeah, I, I know exactly what rule I broke. Like, it's fine. Um, uh, feel a little bit, a little bit dumb, but no, you know, no harm done, I guess. I mean, things like that happen in the heat of the moment. Sometimes you're just full of adrenaline and you can't exactly remember what you're supposed to do. But... Yeah. Yeah. I, I won't forget it now, though. You know, I, I, um, I'm sure if I ever flat or notice I'm flat halfway between the pits, I'll, I'll definitely know what entrance I should go in. Well, and then you raced in uh, Hulst after that. But now what's left on the schedule for you this uh, season? So this is actually this is actually it for me. I, I decided not to go back for the World Championships. Um, so I'm back home in Canada now. I got back a week ago, and with the uh, the rules in Canada right now, um, we have to go into a, a two week quarantine. And because of that, I sort of decided that it it was going to be too hard to train. Um, like we're not even really we're not even really supposed to go outside of our yard right now. Um, so I decided it was going to be too hard to train, and that I didn't want to go and race worlds if I wasn't at my best form. Um, so yeah, this is the end for my season. I'm going to, I'm sort of already getting excited to train for next season and, uh, we'll do a little bit of mountain biking, gravel racing, a little bit of road racing, all this prep towards that. But yeah, for me, just eight races this cross season. So the decision to not race the world is purely down on, uh, your own decision, not that the Canadian Cycling uh, Federation doesn't have any starting places or any uh, funding, because those stories have been going around and I already found them pretty weird. 
Um, nope, it's purely my own decision. So there are actually a few Canadians out there racing. Um, Megalie Rochette and Sydney McGill, um, both elite women, are both going to be out there competing. And mine was just that I, I, I wanted to come home. Um, I know some riders will stay in in Belgium, you know, from Christmas period right through to Worlds. But um, I'm married. I want to go home and, and see my wife and spend some time at home and uh, and. Yeah, it was just made because I didn't feel like I could train properly. And I, I've done enough world championships now that I don't I don't need to do one just to do one. If I'm going to go race worlds, it's because I, I, I'm I trying to do well. I definitely respect that decision. And of course, next year, there's a new season with, um, of course, uh, Fight View, um, the world championships. But next year, also, the UCI uh, points ranking gets reset. So we'll be focused in the beginning of the season and potentially scoring those points in uh, the American races. Yes. Yeah. I will try to go. So we have, uh, we have a few world cups. I don't think the schedule is officially up, but there's a few world cups in the U S um, in October. Um, so my goal before that will be to, be to get even a couple UCI points just so I'm just so I'm staged in a pretty good spot. And then there's so many, then there's so many UCI points at world cups that I think if I can just show up there and, and get points from those, it'll put me in a, a pretty good spot for the rest of the year. Um, but it'll be weird. Like I haven't been in a, uh, if they just, you know, randomly draw names, I haven't been in a, a lottery for, for start position since, oh, probably since 2012. It's been a while. And then I can imagine those world championships being your goal. Is that true? Yeah, that's right. That's, that's the big goal for me. That and, um, and our Pan American championships. I've been on the podium a couple of times at the, the Pan Am championships. Um, and one year I actually lost it in a sprint. So that's that would be a big career goal for me as well i'd i'd love to win that jersey um and then like you said the other big goal is is fayetteville i think especially uh this year i my goal it was is always been to get a top 15 there and i think maybe i showed that it's it's not impossible this year um so that's that's still what i'm targeting moving forward if you're going to prepare for that is that preparation going to perhaps include a trip over to europe to race or is it fully staying over on the other side of the ocean i think it'll probably depend a little bit on what the race calendar ends up being here um if the race calendar is what it, it usually is and sort of ends in december in the beginning of december i will probably travel over and and race care spirit again i think that that experience that quality of racing is really hard to replace but if there's a lot of good races in the U.S., you know, through December and into January, then I then I might stay. Right now, my tentative plan is to race race in North America, you know, through November, race in Belgium in December in the first part of January, and then uh, race the World Championships. So similar to what I normally do, except that Worlds will be, of course, in the U.S. as opposed to uh, in Europe. Well, then I think we had it for this episode of the Cyclocross Social Podcast. I would like to thank our guest, Michael, for coming on. Thank you very much, Noah. It's great to be here. And then later we'll be back with more cyclocross this weekend. We have the World Cup final in Overijs on the program. A preview for that is coming this Friday and this weekend. Of course, Hamme and Overijs expect some podcasts for that as well. Thank you guys for listening. And don't forget to leave a rating and follow Michael um, in his journey next season. See you guys. Goodbye.